ask? So click on continue. I oh, guess conti continue. Yeah, okay, right. Okay. Right. Anyways, so again, we can't be interrupting Dave and we'd be if we're not speaking, Heidi, we should probably mute ourselves, although I don't see where there's a mute thing here for me. Anyways, I just won't talk. I'm muting myself. We still have four minutes. I'm muting myself, and um, I will keep you guys unmuted. Okay. Um, I wanted to get a bigger screen, but I guess I don't know how that this happened. This is fine. This is fine. Everybody's, yeah. their screens are all different anyways. Okay. So we don't have to worry about it. So, I mean, I can start. Uh, you saw what I wrote there, Heidi, but I'm just going to wing it and be spontaneous and try to be humorous and then just get Dave to talk. <laughs> okay. So three, two, one, go. Okay. So welcome, everybody. This Thank is you. a Zoom uh, series that... Uh, we're doing uh, with Dave Wilkes, uh, Heidi Fleming, this wonderful manager in Montreal with whom I used to work years ago, uh, managing Penny Lang and a bunch of other people, Francois Bourassa as well, um, invited me to interview Dave Wilkes, who I found really, really interesting. I read a lot about Dave. Uh, he's done a lot. And I think anybody that's a music aficionado like I am will be quite interested in what he has to say about the industry today, too. So I just want to tell you how this is going to work. We're going to do three interviews. And in the first session, we're going to uh, talk about how it all began, uh, share some of Dave's anecdotes and what keeps him going. And then next week, we're going to do another session and talk about how Dave is involved in Canada and some of the artists up here. And in the third session, he's, um, and that's going to happen the week after next, um, Heidi will post some of these dates for you. Um, we're going to discuss the industry today, and I'm going to ask Dave to share with you his kernels of wisdom, which I know he's garnered over the years, um, and suggestions and recommendations about anybody that wants to get into the business. So let's get started. Uh, Dave's been around for a long time helping to mold the music business since his early days at the bitter end. And yeah, I'm reading from my notes because I want to get it right. Uh, and I was really happy when Heidi uh, asked me to interview him because he's just such an interesting person. And we had a lot in common about just how the philosophy of the people that we worked with. So I'm just going to read like a really mini bio and then we'll get into it. So uh, Dave Wilkes has been an integral figure in New York City's folk scene for six decades as manager of The Bitter End, a music publisher of popular songs, and executive producer of many recordings, a manager and a co-manager of many artists, such as Emmylou Harris, Jerry Jeff Walker, who wrote Mr. Bojangles and My Sisters and I Still Sing That Around the House, Richie Havens, and Barry Manilow, Tom Paxton, Josh White Jr., Heather Pearson, and many, many more. He was also vice president of a &R for Vanguard Records, and he has a long history in record producing, which he'll also talk about, and a folk label, which helped launch the careers of many folk luminaries in the 50s and 60s. He's still an active manager, agent, and recorder of folk artists, but I'll let him talk to you about that as well, and a consultant for the Canadian folk music industry, which we're very interested in and the US representative to the popular folk world music um, group, Sultans of String. So now I'm just gonna let Dave talk. You've heard enough of me. So Dave, I'm just going to ask you some questions and I'm really not gonna interrupt you a lot because it, it's just, I find it's very compelling just listening to you. So um, tell us how it began. Uh, like you, um, I read about your love of folk music and um, your interviews with, uh, you mentioned Pete Seeger. And just as an aside, I had my picture taken with Pete Seeger probably 25 years ago at this folk festival. And I recently posted it on Facebook. And you'd think that I had had my photo taken with God. I mean, I love the guy too. I mean, really, he's, he was everybody's heroes all over the world, not just in the States. So I'd like you to talk to me a bit about what your influence is, 
how you knew Pete. Um, and when you were growing up, I want you to talk about the era in which you grew up, which really, you know, why, how you got the bug of folk music. Right. So uh, tell us, Dave, how did it all begin? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, you know, you gave me a good lead, lead, lead in with, uh, with Pete Seeger, and um, he was one of the, the guys that influenced me the greatest without me even knowing who, who he was. So when I was a kid growing up in the Bronx, my, my parents were basically liberal middle class people who had a good background in, in culture. So there's yeah. always music playing in our house. Um, it would be maybe Odetta or even before Odetta, classical music, Broadway music, uh, jazz. So I'm always listening gospel, you know, Mahili Jackson. So I just grew up with a very wide background of, of music and I didn't really know there was a difference in, in genres. I just knew what I was hearing and it was all great stuff. So I kind of, I guess maybe without knowing it, I, I tuned my ear to listen and appreciate good, good music. Um, being a kind of a liberal family, my parents were always interested in uh, the civil rights movement before it was, you know, before the 60s, before it was, this is going back to the 40s. Whoa, yeah. So um, one of the places that they sent me when I was, I think, six or seven, I don't even know how old I was, was a camp called Camp Woodland in, uh, in the Catskill Mountains in Phoenicia, New York. Now, of course, I didn't even know where Phoenicia was, and I didn't really know anything about it. They said it was a great, really a great place where a, a lot of very nice people, the councils were great, and um, unbeknownst to me, and I didn't find this out until many, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 years later, that Eric Weisberg, you know, the famous folk singer, um, <laughs> a, red, red, a red diaper baby, I see that, right. Um, I guess more like a pink one, you know, but uh, it's true. Um, so Eric Weisberg was one of my um, roommates, my bunk mates. And even years before that, John Harold of the Greenbrier Boys was another one of my roommates or bunk mates. You know, I think we were, like I said, seven years old, eight years old, something like that. I, I can count backwards. So yeah, like seven or eight years old. And it was a, one, it, it was a wonderful place and they had music and one night, Around a fireplace, or a, a, you know, burning in the in the fields, they had this guy who was singing, you know, to us, and with banjo and guitar, an interesting voice, and we all just kind of listened to him, and that was Pete Seeger. I didn't I didn't know oh. who it was, and uh, many many years later, I was attending his festival in uh, off the Hudson River in Sloop, I think. Um, I think it was in Tarrytown, and he was there because I had known him through Vanguard Records and had had a casual relationship with him. But I said, Pete, Pete, I don't know whether to blame you or to thank you for getting me in the. Uh, in the <laughs> you you whetted my appetite for this kind of music, you know. Yeah. Clearwater, Clearwater Festival. That's what it was. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Heidi's a very good manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She is. She is. So, it's actually, um, good that she's chatting because when she, she can fill in some stuff. Well, no, that's we, great. I love that. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, yeah. What, that's what I saw. That. Great. <laughs> so um, that was my lead into interest in folk music, and I didn't really know it was folk music. And of course, I was. I had the uh, the, the the germ of the idea of civil rights. Obviously. Yeah. I didn't. No, there was a problem, especially I wasn't aware of what went on in this in this country. But um, well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Odetta before because uh, we actually had Odetta at in Montreal at the Golem Concert Room. It was Mike Mc um, Mike McDevitt. It was Michael Regan Street that right. had her there, and my best friends actually opened up the show. That I mean, we were all like, "Oh my God, it's Odetta." So it, it affected us too, even of years course, later. This was the eighties, but it was like just such an honor to have her. So I'm going back to the early sixties and when I was in college, you know, yeah. and, uh, listen to this music all the time. And I was in Bloomington, Illinois, and I had a couple of record, record stores downtown. I would walk from the fraternity house that I lived in and 
buy every record that um, they came out, every fo new folk, you know, folk music record, and bring it back to the fraternity. We would play it, and then a couple of guys and myself would work out some arrangements on songs and sing them. Mostly, probably the High Women and Kingston Trio, and that's you know that poppy yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. So, cool. um, yeah. so from that point on, when I graduated college, I uh, got to hang out in Greenwich Village. And uh, I'd be there basically every night mm. and um, met a woman at, at a party. Her name was B. Marks. And she told me that she worked for Fred Weintraub, who owned The Bitter End. I think it was called The Cock and Bull at, the, at that time. It wasn't even The, uh, the Bitter End. Okay. And she invited me to come down. And I just, you know, took it with a grain of salt and didn't go down there. But one night after being at the Cafe Finjan, which was another kind of a world music place around the corner. I was walking by her the club late at night. She happened to be on the phone, which was right next to the door. And she said, Dave, come on in. So I went in mm -hmm. and uh, she told me that they needed an MC, a host. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. It ended up they needed a doorman. And I said, that's pretty good also. You know, so I took that, that job, I think $7 a night. And um, mm -hmm had an importing and exporting company at the time. Oh. Yeah, you know, it was a nice, it was just myself and um, a lawyer and my father, who, you know, it was kind of a side business for them. And I was yeah. doing it all. But it wasn't, it wasn't exciting. It didn't uh, fulfill my uh, desire for culture. Well, of course But not. I did that and then worked at the bitter end at night and then mm -hmm. decided that I wanted to do the, the music scene, you know, all the time. So I handed in my papers. <laughs> to my no, well, that, was, that was a really good step. I mean, I just, you know, you're talking about this. And when we were all little, we just thought, oh, wow, the bitter end. What is that? Like New York City was such a huge thing for us. So like, it's yeah. really cool to be talking to somebody who actually, you know, <laughs> worked there, was the doorman and really you exactly. met so many people. Like I see you, you worked with some really interesting people at the bitter end and meeting them there, Jerry Jeff Walker, of course. I, I always go back to him because of the Mr. Well, I get, I get Jerry Jeff to work there. I met him. Oh, wow. Through Emmy Lou Harris. And I met Emmy Lou Harris through David Bromberg and Paul Siebel. He, so it's actually Jerry. Well, let me just step it back a, a while. Away. So I was in charge of the Hootenanny, which was the month, the Tuesday night of every week. We had a kind of an amateur night there. It wasn't really an amateur. A lot of the guys were professional. Yeah. You know, Jay Leno used to come down to work his material, but nobody knew who he was. <laughs> um, and uh, Dave Bromberg came down and, and played there every Tuesday. So, you know, I kind of got friendly with him. And he told me about this woman named Emmy Lou Harris. And she was singing a song called Mr. Bojingles. I don't know if I told you this last week. Or... No, no, you didn't. You didn't. Right. So it's so, a good so story, she though. Lived, she lived right around the corner on, on this, you know, the, the bitter end was on Bleecker Street. And she lived, I believe, on LaGuardia Place or Thompson Street. And she lived with Paul Siebel. And then she told me about the song Mr. Bojangles and that a guy named Jerry Jeff Walker wrote it. And Dave Bromberg knew him as well. So... Uh, he introduced me to Jerry Jeff, and uh, I became his manager as well. In, in those days, uh, Mr. Bojangles was being played on WBAI, which was a very progressive public radio station. Bob Fast was the jock at late at night, and you know he was way ahead of everybody. He's still around, but I don't know if he's still on WBAI. And he was playing Mr. Bojangles. Nobody else was playing it. Nobody else knew the, the song existed. Which I found was ludicrous because you know you hear the song once and you know, yeah. <laughs> you know your whole work well you know what the song is right yeah That's exactly it. yeah so um, Jerry was in a group called Circus Maximus who recorded for Vanguard Records a little you know of course later on I ended work, working for Vanguard but um, Maynard Solomon I guess didn't think that that song was was good or maybe he never heard it you know I don't know. Mm -hmm. But nobody did anything about it. Jerry left Circus Maximus. I managed them and I made the rounds to the record companies with the song. Right. So uh, 
I took I took the song to John Hammond and he thought it was wonderful and he wanted to, to sign it. And I took the song to Jerry um, Wexler. No, okay. I'm sorry, Ahmed Erdogan and Jerry Greenberg. And he wanted to sign it. So at that time I became, I went back to Fred Weintraub in the management business and kind of like merged my, my company with his. And the Fred had a very successful management company with uh, the Four Seasons and Neil Diamond, you know, uh, people like that. And it was, a, it was pretty exciting to be involved with his company. So with his office and his lawyer, we made the deal for Jerry with um, Atlantic Records. Meanwhile, John Hammond loved the song so much, he recorded it with a, a piano cocktail singer named Bobby Cole. And, and, that, and he was gonna put the record out first. And we told him he couldn't do that because Jerry had the first recording, it was his song. And so we had the right to hold it back to Jerry. Right. But when, um, when Jerry's record came out on ATCO, which was a division of Atlantic, the first week it came out, and it went to like number 50 or 40 in the charts. Columbia, uh, it was really Date Records, which was a division of Columbia, put out the Bobby Cole. I'm sure his name was Bobby, but it was definitely Cole. His rendition of Mr. Bojangles. And that went to, well, here's, here's how it worked. Atlantic took a big ad, full page billboard ad on Mr. Mr. Bojangles, Jerry Jeff Walker. Boom, it went on the charts. Mm -hmm. The next week, Columbia came out with their rendition and said, Bobby Cole, the, the better, more popular version. They took a full page ad and that went to number 47. Mm -hmm. The next week, Atlantic Records took out another full page. This, this is like the way you used to do it in the, in the business, right? Yeah. And um, that went to number 30 or whatever. And just keep, kept on bouncing up. So the two records would, I think, I don't know if, if either one of them got higher than top 15 or so, somewhere in that area. These are folk music but this is pop the pop charts, top 100. Right. So Mr. Bojangles was on the charts twice at the same time. And, you know, and that rest started, that was Jerry's, uh, Jerry's history. Right, right. The, well, you were also Bar Barry Manilow's first manager and, uh, and you worked with jazz people too, like Barry uh, Bella Fleck, who I adore, and Jerry Douglas. But um, I didn't, really work your, with, your, your... I didn't really work with Bella Fleck. I've done recordings with him. Okay. And, and I know him well through, probably through Jerry Douglas. But um, I hooked up Bella Fleck with uh, Chris McCool of the Sultans of String and, and Bella recorded. Oh, well, that's good. Through my, you know, my uh, urging. I mean, it wasn't much urging. Everybody knows ba Bella and what a great addition to the Sultans of Strings uh, yeah. record. Well, why don't you tell us a bit about um, well, Barry Manilow, and also, like, I, let's hear some anecdotes, because you, you told us some anecdotes last week that I thought were sort of cute, like just stories about your relationships with some of these people, and, and how, um, how it is to actually, you know, be somebody's manager, and, and the warmth and the frustrations that come with all of that, but there's some really funny stories. You know, I had so many funny stories with Penny, I, I can't tell you. The other one I wanted to ask you about was Towns Van Zant. Um, he, apparently he spent time in New York. So I'm just wondering, did you ever hook up with yeah, him? Yeah, well, Towns became a friend of, of Jerry Jeff, obviously, and that whole, and Emmy. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and um, so that was kind of, even though he didn't, I don't think he lived in New York. He was always from, like a Texas guy, right? Okay, yeah. And Towns, and, and he's and he's an amazing, amazing songwriter, great, yeah. great artist. Um, I want to get back to Emmy though, because Emmy yeah. in Paris and was right around the corner living with Paul. So uh, I I made a, a recording with her, and uh, we had uh, Paul Siebel and Dave Bromberg and Gary White, who was the bass player and wrote long, long time that Linda Ronset had a giant. Oh. Oh yes, that's my favorite. And also Eric Weisberg, who I mentioned was a was a was a camp a bunkmate of mine. But we didn't know that at that time either. You know, it came out, you know, later than that. So um, I was also managing a guy named Gamble Rogers, who uh, was with the Serendipity Singers, which okay. the bitter end also managed. And uh, RCA was interested in him. And they gave me studio time to bring him in to do a demo. 
And I brought along Emmy Lou Harris as well and did a demo with Emmy, you know. Wow. They, they passed on both of them. It's just like, you know. <laughs> right. Imagine. Yeah, and then I took Emmy to Vanguard Records, who, you know, and they said, well, we already have Joan Baez. It's like, you know, you can't have two. Did you have two? <laughs> and um, took it to Elector Records, and they probably, I don't know if they said to me that they have Judy Collins, but they didn't, you know. I, I just don't, I can't figure out that the, uh, you know. <laughs> um, I can't figure out how the industry can say that they, you know, develop acts. It just, it, it's a transom with them. They, things come in, they maybe they spend time thinking about it, maybe they don't. They don't really analyze each artist and think, wow, this is great. You know? Yeah. Somebody wise said to me, how can you have too many Joan Baez type folk singers or females, you know? Yeah. And they're different, you know. I mean, Emmy is completely different than Joan. And Judy is different than all three of them. And each one has a has a great place. So you never can have too many great artists, you know, whatever. whatever. Well, no, it's like like you said, you can't have too many no. great artists. A great artist is a great artist. So yeah. I went everywhere with, with Emmy. Meanwhile, I was booking her and I booked her on the coffee house circuit. And uh, I'll tell you one of the disappointments in a minute. Just remind me about that. But sure. um, I, I know that Emmy always felt bad after the fact that I didn't go on the tour with her. You know, mm -hmm. um, this is way before Graham Parsons. This is yeah. uh, in 19, yeah. I, I signed Emmy in 1968. May, you know, and I was working with her before I even signed, signed it. So this would be probably 67. And um, I didn't realize how shy she was. You know, I mean, I would never go on stage and sing a song. I couldn't even walk on the, in the bitter end stage when we had a fire and tell everybody to leave because I had <laughs> stage fright. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I, I hear you. <laughs> but she, you know, and so she always felt that uh, I should have been there and she had to go get up a plane in, in Albany, I think it was, and not not know where she was going because somebody picked her up. But that's that's another story altogether. So uh, I made up, I made, um, yeah, well, I mean, she would like somebody to be a, her tour manager probably. But yeah. the coffee house circuit used to pay $75 for three days of performance at a university. Plus they give you room and board. So you would right. have no expenses. Then you'd have a day travel and then another school that was in that circuit. Let's say Albany and then maybe the next day travel to RPI, which is in Troy. So it's, you can almost walk there. Um, and then another $75. And then every member that you had in the group was wasn't another 75, but it was, it was somewhat less and also room and board. So a group in 1962, 63, 64, well, it, was, it was later than 62, 65, 66, they could stay alive. You know, right. they would work, they would work uh, five or six or seven weeks in a row. They would probably be due like 14 colleges, build up a real following, didn't have room, didn't have board, they'd get a gas allotment or a travel allotment from one university to the other. So, um, by the way, this Canadian company that's, that emulated my uh, my idea, you know, and they're still in in business right now, and that's Roots. Um, oh. And I'm trying to think of my my friend who started that. He recently passed. For some reason, I'm drawing a, a blank. But you guys know who he is. He has a. Son. Well, Heidi should know. Heidi. <laughs> Nathan. She has uh, to think. She has to think. The Sun is, it has to do with uh, Gamble, with uh, Stan Rogers and... Uh, oh, okay. Anyway, so I, um, so I, I made a deal with Emmy Lou Harris with uh, Jubilee Records. Right, exactly, that's the guy. Yeah. And um, with Jubilee Records and Mickey Eichner, who later became the head of VP for Columbia Records, it was a, it was a lovely record recorded with all the guys that Emmy liked and, and grew up with, as I mentioned, Bromberg and Paul Siebel and uh, Eric Weisberg and Gary. And in the midst of, now this is good, this, I shouldn't even be talking about this, but what the hell, let's make this interesting, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. In the midst of the, our recording, Emmy, um, Emmy uh, got a boyfriend who she didn't later marry who decided he wanted to be the manager. Okay. And he got a and he got a a, a big agent, I think William Morris, 
named Shelly Schultz, who's who I'm friendly with even now. And as a matter of fact, we just uh, Facebooked each other. And um, he wanted to bring in a producer who was the arranger for the Leon Bibb television show. I hope it's Leon Bibb. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of basically like a cocktail sort of a guy, you know, very poppy strings and boom. And I knew it was terrible, terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working for MCA Music at the time. But to step back again, the reason I was working at, M at uh, MCA Music is I arranged for Fred Weintraub's publishing companies to be sold in a partnership with, with MCA Music, which is also Universal Films and Universal Records. That became a big deal. Fred made it, uh, a deal with Neil, Di Neil Diamond to go to leave Bang Records and to go to MCA uh, Universal Records. Right. So um, Emmy wanted a release on, from, from a contract and I knew it was a bad deal and I resisted for almost a year. And then after that, you know, how can you keep a, an artist who you're really a, attracted to under contract if she doesn't want to do it? Yeah. So I gave her a release, Shelly Schultz and Tom, her boyfriend became her manager. And they did some cockamamie cocktail album. One of the songs was Rain, Rainbows, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, which is a, which is a great song. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't really what Emmy, you know, wanted yeah. to do. Slick, and she didn't want to do it. So that record's still around, but uh, she was never happy with that. So that was a big, that was one of the, the, the few disappointments in my career, just not really continuing my relationship with her. And yeah. I have actually, yeah, it was because I thought she was wonderful and I got national television, syndicated TV for it, com television commercials, had her working as much as she wanted to. It was, it was, we were off to a real great start for a, basically a, a brand new uh, artist. Yeah, well, so, that's it. Eh? It's like they have, everybody has their story. Yeah. But in my last commission check, I bought a beautiful piece of antique furniture. <laughs> well, that's good. You got something. That, that, that's increased in value by about 20 times. But still, there's no, you know, it's nothing. That's not what I wanted. I was I didn't get into this business to be an antique dealer. No, no. You and you can't win, win them all, right? So so uh, any, anyway, uh, Emmy Lou decided that she wanted after I think the being disappointed with the spring deal with the uh, Jubilee deal she decided to take a couple of years off went back to Virginia to live with her parents had a back operation yeah and then she started to do song singing in uh, Washington DC area and that's I believe she met Graham there okay and um you know, and then got started to be noticed again. Mary Martin, who worked for Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. offered her a deal, and um, she took it. And then, and she ended up in Nashville, and becoming you know a very, very important artist. All right. Yeah. Well, well, you've worked with other important artists too. So, um. I want to hear about some of the artists that you've worked with, what, what it was really like being an artist manager for you. And I just saw somebody walk into a room <laughs> behind uh, I, you. My, my wife, probably. Oh, okay. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, I, I mean, because all of this has a, an effect on us too. Like when we're working with artists, how it affects our families as well, you know? So when you have a good artist, like uh, Heidi's been with Francois Bourassa for a, a long, long time. And when we had Penny, they were, they, you know what I mean? They sort of become part of your family. So I imagine when you were at the bitter end, you, that was a while back, and you went on for years with people like Emmy, Lou Harris. Well, Lou Harris. Well, this is my daughter's boss. Let me shut the door home. Okay, no worries. <laughs> something like that was bound to happen <laughs> it always happens in zoom <laughs> no it's great it's part of yeah. it's part of life yeah. so um i went to a school in bloomington illinois called illinois wesleyan university right. 
and they had one of the best music schools in, in the country. Of course, I didn't take advantage of any of that because I didn't know that, what I was going to be doing. Right. And there was a young lady who was in the drama area, and I bumped into her in New York. Um, and uh, the school had a choir, and they traveled to Columbia University. So I wanted to see them, and I met this this woman who you know had gone to college with me a few years younger, and she I said she was a drama and a singer, and we started to date, and then she told me that she was uh, singing with this arranger band leader um, named Barry Manlow, because nobody knew who Barry was. Okay. So I went to pick her up, and I met Barry. They were living in in Brooklyn, and then. Um, you know, I started to listen to his music. He was he was the music director for The Drunken, which was on 13th Street in the, in the, in the West Village, which was, a, you know, kind of like a little operetta musical comedy. And, um, you know, he's telling me how he composed music and how he's arranged. And he's very, he was a very bright guy. I liked him. And um, he had this woman named Jeannie Lucas, who was, I wouldn't say that she was the spit image of Bette Midler because she came first. So Bette Midler was the spit image of Jeannie Lucas. Okay. And I booked them mostly in the New York area. And, you know, they, people that, that uh, saw them loved them. You know, she was got, well, you know, with Bette's side. So that's what Jeannie and Barry was amazing on, you know, the arrangement, the piano. And then, um, Jeannie decided that she didn't want to go on the road. I had a bunch of dates for them, I think, in the, in the Chicago area, and she wanted to get married. And so that, you know, so that kind of slowed that down. And Barry wanted to go back to being, uh, I never understood this, but he knew what he was doing, a page at CBS. So I gave him a release. Mm -hmm. And um, the next thing I know, he's, he calls me up and says, uh, that he's playing at the downstairs upstairs with with Bette Midler and do I want to cut? I was at Vanguard Records at the time, and um, so I went down there uh, up there to uh, to see the uh, uh, to see Bette and Barry, and uh, that was the day that Ahmed Erdogan was there and, and signed and signed Bette. So, yeah. Um, so you know, that, of course, that was the deal for Bette, but Barry was really the big time at this, and then. Um, Later on, I think he he signed with Bell Records as an artist himself. Right. And he called me up. I was at Vanguard Records, and he wanted to see me. So he came down. My wife, Leslie, and I took him out for lunch. And he told me that um, Larry Utah had sold the company, and Clive Davis had taken it over. And that <laughs> Clive just looked at he was a cock that Barry was a cocktail singer. <laughs> and Barry was Gar Barry was depressed, and um, I don't even know if, if Barry's mother was with us for that lunch or what. But um, so that's what that's when I went to see him up at the at the up at the duplex with with Ben. But it worked out because a guy named Bob Esposito came came along with a song called Randy or Mandy. Mandy. Well, it was Brandy at first. Oh, okay. But Clive changed the name from Brandy to Mandy because I think it, there was another song, maybe the Tony Orlando song. It was Brandy, yeah. Brandy, you're fine, you know. So, um, and that was Barry's gigantic hit, first one, I think. Well, my favorite, <laughs> my, sorry, my favorite was Weekend in New England. And right, I was I, like, I was 17 when I heard Weekend in New England. I was with my first boyfriend and everybody was, as you know, Barry, you know, when you're talking about him being a lounge singer kind of thing, it's like, it sort of wasn't really cool to like Barry exactly, Manilow, exactly. But, but I loved him. And everybody did. And, and, yeah. and all, everybody knew that it wasn't that cool and they didn't care, right? They just Yeah, did. yeah, yeah. I just saw this Clive Davis special on Netflix. I, I have to jump in. It's kind of oh. like ABBA. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, right. we're not going to go there. <laughs> we're not going to go there. No, it's true. No, so um, I saw this Netflix thing on Clive Davis, and yeah. um, I believe that Barry was in was interviewed. I don't. I, I know that Barry didn't write the song. I write the songs. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, because he, you know, he was a songwriter, right? He is a songwriter. Right. 
Yeah. I don't even, and I thought that he said on the on the Netflix show that he didn't even write the Weekend in New England or whatever. I have to look at the credits. We should Google the credits and see who actually is the writer. But you know, five, yeah, well, I'll five, do that for the next one. All right, all right. Yeah, because it's going to take a while. All right, yeah, no, true. Yeah, but so, uh, but we heard he we heard he wrote the commercial for McDonald's. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I, I wrote a lot of the songs, but the ones yeah. that everybody thinks, including the song I write the songs, I don't think he wrote. <laughs> he didn't write them. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll we'll have to look over the yeah between now and the next one. We'll have to look and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do that this week. I'll check it out. So getting back to before I well, I just oh, jumped yeah. maybe move to to Barry, but um, so Paul Siebel was living with Emmy. And I got to know him and I managed him as well and made a deal with him for Electra Records. And that became, um, well, Louise was one of them, Bride, uh, Bride 45. Mm -hmm. Just an amazing album. That's probably my wife and I, my favorite song, album to listen to. And um, yeah, Paul was just was really great. Yeah. So I signed him to MCA Music where I was working at that time. And then did demos with him and took him over to to Electra and Paul uh, Peter Siegel, who was the A and R guy over there, signed him. So, but what I find interesting, Dave, about what you've done is, I mean, you've done it. You know, you've gone from like doorman to manager to a record producer to, to publisher, the to publishing, years. recording, and it's like it's. What I like about it, the reason that I wanted to call this first video falling into, you know, is that that's how a lot of people get. I mean, I fell into music, too. I never thought I'd work in the music industry. But it's like you seem to have fallen into everything. You didn't have a game plan and it's worked for you. And I like that. And I like it. It's sort of serendipitous. So we have two minutes left. OK, so. We're gonna to have to wrap this up, but I oh, no, because we no, got two I'm minutes. Just, I'm just getting going here. I know. So we got next week, and we got a lot of stuff coming up next week because we're going to talk about Canadian artists. We're going to talk about Penny. Um, I mean, what what I just want to sum up is I was just very happy to hear about um, Emmy Lou. I mean, I've always loved her, and and Barry Manilow too. Plus, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I just think the fact that. Uh, Mr. Bojangles and Jerry Jeff Walker. I mean, all of these people that you worked with, the thing that I love about folk music is that it's family. It, it feels like family. And you seem to have walked through every space with these people, like from being the manager to the before we hang up. Yeah. All the acts that I spoke to you about were a four week, a four block radius. Ah, see, there you go. Yeah. Proximity, it's the best. Yeah, and they all know each um, other and they all supported each other. Yeah, Heidi, your, your comment, we're talking about Penny next week. There's three different sessions, as I said in the beginning. So we're gonna talk about Penny then. All right. But Dave, like, I really wanna thank you. I mean, this is really interesting. We're gonna post this this week. Um, all right, great. On people's different sites, on Facebook, etc. And next week, we're, it's gonna be great. To, to talk about your Canadian uh, implications. And, um, and maybe we'll get a few last comments from Heidi that keeps throwing us off. <laughs> but this has been great. And I want to thank Heidi too. I mean, this is uh, this is what it's about. It's about- Thank you so much, Dave. Great I, uh, mentor for me over the years. Thank you. And love to hear your stories, but I don't think three hours is going to be enough. Three yeah. times 40. So well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll...